evening for our program, Clean Water at Risk, Let's Save It. My name is Heather Lip. I am a member of Storm Surge. We also would like to welcome those who are watching at, on our Facebook page live. We are so grateful that the Newburyport Senior Community Center has taken us in this evening. Our series, titled Towards a Resilient Newburyport, aims to discuss the issues, ideas, and action steps detailed in the city's resiliency plan. This evening's program and our May and June, June programs have been focused on water. Too much, flooding, too little, drought, pollution and water quality, supply, and always conservation. In August, we will shift our discussion to community planning. Rick Tainter will speak about zoning and ordinances and how communities like ours can use land use regulations to reduce risks to people and property and mitigate the impacts on climate from residential and commercial development. This program will be held here on Tuesday, August 31st at 7 p.m. Now to this evening. John Eric White, our speaker this evening, has been the city engineer in Newburyport since 2009. Prior to assuming his role here, he worked as an engineer and project manager in the private sector for both public and private clients. He designed and managed products for the MWRA's Boston Harbor Cleanup, including the new wastewater treatment plant on Deer Island. He worked on the Central Artery Tunnel, MBTA Route Commuter Rail Extension into the South Shore, and a number of private, commercial, and residential developments, and highway projects throughout the state. After his presentation, panelists Tracy Adamski and Thomas Cusick Jr. will join John Eric for questions from the audience. Tracy is a vice president with Ty and Bond, the consulting company hired by the city to update the Artichoke Reservoir Watershed Protection Plan by addressing climate impacts and providing recommendations intended to make our water supply resilient for decades to come. Tom is Newberry Port's Water Treatment Superintendent. He has experience working on water treatment, demand and supply, and watershed management here and in other communities in our region. We welcome all three of you. A microphone stand will be located in the middle of the center aisle. It will be placed there for your use during our discussion. We hope a long line will form so that we can all take advantage of the expertise available to us this evening. Your question may be sitting on the lips of another member of the audience, so please don't be shy. Finally, thanks again to the staff from the Newburyport Senior Community Center, Storm Search Volunteers, and the NCM Hub. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for attending, and thank you to Storm Surge for um, allowing us to present this tonight. Um, in attendance, we have uh, Mayor Holiday. If you could wave an acknowledgement. <laughs> we also have the um, town manager for West Newberry, Angus Jennings. There's a whole bunch of other people. I'm not going to go through each with the city councilors and everyone else, but those two I wanted to bring up uh, because a lot of this has to do with, obviously has to do with both communities. So, the reason for me speaking is um, I've been on the resiliency committee since the inception, and by putting the help, putting the plan together, um, it, took, it took us about five years, um, um, and it addressed all the changes that we need to make to our infrastructure due to climate change, and I was the uh, primary person to deal with like the infrastructure itself, um, mainly because of my role as a city engineer. Um, so tonight, obviously, the topic is water supply. Uh, the resiliency plan itself is loaded with everything. Every asset that we have, we've looked at in detail. Go to our website, check it out. Um, it's very, very comprehensive. 
I myself am not an expert in water treatment, water supply, or watershed management. I'm the messenger. So we have a great staff. Tom's our treatment plant operator. We hired Tracy from Time Bond. They put together, what I'm going to present everything that they put together. Um, the plant itself has AECOM as the plant operator, as the, the consultant to help Tom with his treatment um, issues. Um, our city engineering department, we have two up in my staff. Both of them, Diane and Nick, um, helped out with this, and they've helped out with the resilience plan. So as you listen to me, I'm the messenger. Uh, please ask questions, and we'll try to get the uh, we'll try to get an answer for you. So it all started. Um, the reason for hiring uh, Ty and Bond it started with the artificial watershed protection plan. We needed to update this plan to incorporate uh, the impacts that climate change is going to have on our watershed. This plan itself is actually pretty thick. It's pretty comprehensive. Put together by Weston Sampson. Uh, very well done. And again, we needed to update it strictly for the impacts of climate change. Uh, we put out an RFP, request for proposals. Um, Time Bond was the chosen firm. Uh, this is actually the cover of the proposal itself. Time Bond has, they have over 100 years, they've been in business for over 100 years. Uh, they are specialists in watershed protection, dams, and they have 400 employees. Uh, 125, got this off from your website, 125 uh, professional engineers. So, you know, they're stacked with uh, experts in this. So we, uh, this report that they helped uh, update uh, is gonna be pretty comprehensive. It's also the beginning, we're at the very beginning of this climate change uh, work. The outline for tonight is, I'm gonna describe the existing system, describe how climate change is gonna impact our system, uh, discuss what we're currently doing to make it more resilient, and, uh, and then also come up with some things that uh, things that you can do to help out. And sorry for the formatting at the last minute. It looks like you've got a little disjointed. This is a snapshot of the draft report that Time Bond has so far. The final report should be out in the next couple weeks. Uh, most of what I'm talking about tonight is to be based on this on this on this draft report. They deal with water supply and demand, watershed protection recommendations for recommended watershed management practices, and resiliency recommendations. That's the big one. For those of you that are not aware, uh, this is what our watershed looks like. And a watershed is actually, it's the area of land, for those that don't know, it's the area of land that drains all streams and rainfall to a common outlet. In this case, it's the lower point of the lower Artichoke Dam. It's, a, it's the a spillway um, near Starry Ave. So everything from that point up, all, all the rain goes into this watershed and drains over that spillway. All the pollutants emanating from this zone have a, uh, I mean, all the pollutants that enter, that enter into the watershed, um, the closer you are to the tributary, the, the more dangerous it is, and the, more, the, the higher risk we have for contaminating our supplies. But the most susceptible area is the zone A boundary. 400 feet from the, from the water body, 200 feet from the tributary. Unfortunately, in this watershed, we have a lot of properties in the zone A. And again, zone A is the most sensitive area. In a perfect world, you want to keep everyone away from the zone A. We are not that fortunate. Um, homes, yards, farms, everything, everything unnatural poses a threat to the public supply. The zone B, is in blue, the zone A is in yellow, um, the zone B is in blue, and that's a half mile. Uh, just to give you enough, a rough idea of what we're looking at, 80% of our water supply is 
coming from the three reservoirs, the, the three surface reservoirs. And just a small fraction comes from wells one and two and the Barley Springs Pond. One thing I want to uh, let you guys know is as I go through these slides, just relax, take in whatever you want to take in. Um, some, of them, some of them have a lot of detail, but I don't recommend trying to read everything. It's more of just get a rough idea, because this is a very general discussion. Indian Hill, um, maximum depth is about 25 feet. Average depth, 20.8. Sediment layer, about a foot. And it holds about 755 million gallons. The upper artichoke is 12.2 feet. Average depth of 6.9, right here. Sediment layer 1.7. Um, the area south of Rogers Street, it's technically part of the upper artichoke, but I like to segregate it. The, the firm that did our bath bathymetric, they also separated for, for, for analysis and volume purposes. And it's actually a good idea because knowing the volumes helps us manage the water with algae blooms and how to treat it. This area um, is very shallow, 1.6 feet. The volume of both is 269 million gallons. The lower artichoke, uh, this is the one you see by the highway, or you know, 113. Maximum depth is about 11 feet. Uh, average is 4.7. That's below my chin, 4.7. Sediment layer, 1.7, with a volume of 50 mg. So as you can see, the Indian Hill is the deepest, and that's less susceptible to algae blooms, and we're going to discuss that a little bit tonight. This graph originated um, from one of our prior reports, Face Bofford and Thorndike actually the original, I updated it to give it more information. This graphic is loaded with information. I have it on my wall. Uh, Tom will probably put it on his wall. It provides volumes, invert elevations, and for you, it shows the simple simplicity of how the water actually flows. It, it goes from Indian Hill in series, from Indian Hill to um, through a stream, through goes underneath Indian Hill Street, Pikes Bridge, it reaches the Upper Artichoke tributary, goes under the Rogers Street, and then into the Upper Artichoke. So that's a stream that goes through many people's property. Very slow moving stream, very shallow. Um, primarily, the stream was created for the as a result of the Indian Hill Reservoir, but it now that the stream is there, it's, it's still acting as a as a conduit for the surface water. But it's primarily from the Indian Hill. So any one of these reservoirs, if they get impacted, they all go down. Because we, we don't have any means of segregating any of these reservoirs. Uh, the only segregation we have are dams between them. And pipes on the upper artichoke only, the upper artichoke dam, has a pipe. And we're able to close that. But the, um, and we do, we are able to close the Indian Hill. So we are able to close them, but we aren't able to um, uh, mix water from one to the other. And if one gets contaminated, we have to shut everything down. Um, this is a graphic of where our dams are. So the one at the top is, that's actually Curzon Mill. I asked it out because there's an error the typo. Uh, that's Curzon Mill. Curzon Mill itself, um, I'll show it on the next graph. That, that, that has nothing to do with our water supply. Um, it's prim primarily for, I think it was an old uh, grist mill, an old mill of some sort. It moved a, a, a paddle wheel. Uh, but the lower artichoke dam is the one by Starry Ave, Route 113. The upper artichoke is when you're on Plummer Spring looking north. Uh, you can see it a few hundred feet away. And then Indian Hill. You can't see any hill from the road. You have to get off and, and walk the path. And again, Curzon Mill is uh, it's unrelated to the water supply. I wanted to show this graphic in case somebody has any questions. Um, the lower artichoke, 
this is the spillway itself. And it, it's, the spillway is an 80 foot wide concrete, it's 80 foot wide concrete. And um, currently, this made our number one things to do on the resiliency plan because it's our water supply and the dam itself, that spillway is three feet below the current FEMA 100 year flood elevation. In our defense, or you know, it, the, the FEMA got updated a number of years ago, so it hasn't been three feet below the 100 year flood for 20, 30 years. It just recently happened when FEMA updated the maps. When they first built it, it was at the 100 year storm. A lot of you folks probably don't realize, but the um, Lower Archoke Dam is actually an earthen dam, 4,300 feet long. Um, the spillway is what is used to control the flooding. So it controls the water. Um, hydraulic engineers, um, they perform H&H &H study. I'll talk about that a little bit. But that's what the spillway for. The spillway is to control the flow of the water. For us, the intake pipe for all three reservoirs is right near the spillway. Happy day. It's the pump station's right there. So if there's a breach, it doesn't, it won't take long for the water to reach the spillway. So we have plans to move it. And a lot of things I'm talking about is when things were built back then, climate change was an issue. So everything we're talking about tonight. I'm going to do my best that, you know, they did, a good, they did the best they could. The engineers, I would say, did a good job. Um, there's certain things that we would change nowadays because of climate change. We wouldn't, certainly wouldn't have reservoirs this shallow. But in their defense, way back then, in the early 1900s, the lower Ardshoke was built, the upper, and then uh, Indian Hill was like in the 70s. So everything we're talking about today we're looking at it with a new lens, and that's important. The Upper Artichoke is a 225-foot concrete dam. It's, um, it's above the 100-year flood, so we're all set with that, the current 100-year flood. Indian Hill, um, this is the gatehouse at the dam. Um, technically, there's an overflow structure, and, but and really uh, very infrequent, heavy, heavy storm events. That uh, access drive is, will act as a spillway. It'll go, it'll go over that. So this is where we get to the nuts and bolts of um, land areas. So a lot of people don't realize um, the vast majority of our watershed is not in our community. Um, West Newbury right now has just like 3,000 acres of the watershed, both land and water in West Newbury. 508 is in Newbury. And we actually have the least amount, uh, 453. So all in all, it's about 4,000 acres. Um, and we're only um, a fraction in, in, in our, in, fraction is in, in our town. All right, so this is the fun part of the slide of this presentation. Um, our assistant engineer, uh, is also a drone um, pilot, and uh, I asked him to go out and uh, show the watershed so I, we could present it to you folks. So the beginning of the video I'm about to show you is leg one, then we're going to jump on leg two. The graphic's important, so try to remember roughly what we're looking at. Leg two is going to head towards Indian Hill, and then leave and go towards uh, that far west end of Garden Street and Indian Hill Street, further over. And then leg three heads up towards Route 113, which a lot of people don't realize. Those houses and those cars on 113 are dumping into our uh, water supply. It escaped. Uh, there we go. You said there was a delay. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> All right. So relax. This is um. Full screen. What? Full screen. Up above you. Oh, you can still see that now. Okay. Uh, full screen. Hold on. Coming. Uh, not yet. Let's okay. stay there.
So this is about three minutes long. Um, but it's really, uh, it, 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 it'll, it'll help enlighten you to what we're dealing with. So this is looking at the Longfellow neighborhood. So this is our own neighborhood right there. So we have our own developments that I'll talk about in a minute. Now we're heading towards Rogers Street. That's Rogers Street. This is at 8X. That's where the car's going fast. More than 8X got Nick and I busy. Which I assume you would do. Um, now we go to leg two, heads towards Indian Hill. It follows the stream. That's the stream that comes from Indian Hill. Goes right through people's properties. I mean, obviously. That's the Indian Hill Dam. I promise I keep quiet, but see the farms? So that's a Christmas tree farm right on the water. Hint, hint. This follows another tributary up towards Mount 13. All the runoff from all this ends up in our water supply. There's uh, Mr. Federico. All right. Um, so how does climate change, um, how does it merge with our water supply? Uh, our wa wa people's municipalities' water supplies uh, encompass a lot of things. It's water supplies, water surface protection, public education, which is part of tonight, aquatic conditions, uh, water, future water demand, you know, the demand needs, emergency management, dam and flood control. For us, it's dam and flood control because we have dam. Uh, not every water supply is uh, Water distribution and then water treatment. So climate change does impact everything. Um, the primary impacts of climate change are rising seas because 
our reservoirs are connected to the Merrimack River. At this location, Merrimack is tidal. So as seas rise, it'll eventually overtake our reservoir. <coughs> more intense storm events. Heavy rains will wash away more pollutants, <coughs> send them further downstream without the benefit of getting absorbed into the ground for filtering. So when you hear in, uh, heavy rains, that's not good. The rain itself isn't a problem. You know, watch it go, but it, 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 it's too fast, too much. Um, droughts, lack of rain, obviously the lack of rain prevents the recharge of the water supply. Eventually the supply runs out, i.e. Lake Powell and right now out west. Droughts accelerate the evaporation process of the water supply. Um, during this whole process I've learned, I've learned a lot. You know, dry air, winds, atmospheric pressure can lower a reservoir's water level many inches per day. Um, I'm new to this. I thought that was uh, quite, quite interesting. Hotter atmospheric temps is another component of climate change. That speaks for itself. Hotter water, more evaporation, more algal blooms, um, and just more difficult to treat. Excuse me. So this is just a, a current event. Um, this is this actual article here was from 2019. They've been experiencing this drought for years. This picture is courtesy of um, the Arizona Daily Star. I think this picture was taken in the last week. So you can see the water marks on the rock. Uh, it's you know dozens and dozens of feet down. Uh, this is an article from the other day, uh, the 23rd, and uh, they are in um, a, a whole, they're in a very, very serious crisis. Uh, for this group, I figured I'd throw uh, a little tidbit. Um, you know, the, we all know the deniers claim that it, this isn't real. Um, Eunice Foote, 1856, did an experiment. Uh, she put <coughs> air in a glass jar, capped it, put one, put it, one in the sun, and one in one in the shade. I don't have that result, but it's it's over on this right side. The lower left, she also put carbonic acid, carbon, um, in a, in a bottle. Put it one in the shade, one in the sun. So on the lower left, in the shade, um, the carbon uh, acid gas was, those are four samples, 80 to 85. In the sun, 90 to 120. The regular air, and I apologize for not zooming in, but the, the regular air was half that. And the, her experiment proved that carbon in the atmosphere is a huge problem. Now I'm going to talk about the water supply and, and the flood, uh, the dams itself, and what, we, what, how climate change can impact, and what we're, what we're doing to prevent it. The current FEMA flood elevation is throughout the watershed. This is the current FEMA flood map pieced together. Is there's four different uh, panels? Actually, I think six. But. This is a graphic that, that our engineering department put together for the resiliency plan. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, except if, if you are interested, you can go to the resiliency plan on the website. Uh, we have many more graphics for uh, looking at flood maps and what flooding from future sea level rise will look like. This one here is mean high water with sea level rise added. The current mean high water is about elevation five at the Merrimack and the, at the Artichoke. It's about, about elevation five, 5.2 to be exact. Um, when you add two feet, that'll be the yellow. It encroaches up to about 113. It doesn't overtop the dam. Four, uh, three feet, which is our, our estimate of the year 2070. Three feet is orange. It doesn't change much. but the resilience plan looked at 2070 as, as one of the dates, so we, we, we had to throw it in there. 
uh, not much different. Six feet goes all the way to the upper dam. Uh, we also put together flood maps showing the sea level rise on top of the 100 year storm. So most people can look at our, our current mean high water, current everyday life with mean high water, and what sea level rise does to it. This is the 100 year flood, which is already high. So most of us don't see where the 100 year flood happens because we haven't seen it yet. Um, the Mother's Day was, was close. But what we did is we took the 100 year flood, the current FEMA, and added um, six feet of sea level rise to that to create these flood maps. And essentially the cyan is the current FEMA, as you saw before on the prior slide. And then each increment, each incremental uh, increase of sea level rise from the year 2030 and 2070, the yellow and the orange, you can barely see it. The red, you can all barely, barely see. So what that shows is we are, this is, this is one of the positive things. Our reservoir is right next to a, a steep topography. So unlike Miami, three feet of a rise in Miami, you lose half Florida. This is six feet of our reservoir, and the shoreline doesn't even leave the existing shoreline horizontally, hardly at all. So when you see the colors so close together, it's because we added six feet to the graphic. The water surface six feet higher is red. It only goes further into the land a little bit. What I like about that is that if we can convince the state, DCR, the Office of Dam Safety, if one of our chosen proposals is to raise the dam, increase the volume, and benefit ourselves, we can prove that there's less impact to people because we aren't taking away like a half mile of people's property. I look at that as a positive thing. Um, as I said before, uh, time bond is part of the report. One of the things that engineers do um, when, when you're dealing with dams is you perform a H and H analysis, hydro hydrologic and hydraulic study. Um, they needed to do it for two reasons. One was to evaluate our existing dam, and the other was to assist with, um, if, we, if we move forward with a new dam, you also have to do an H&H &H for a new dam. So they helped with coming up with a conceptual, very conceptual, rough layout of what a new dam would look like, raising it higher. We asked them to do the H&H &H based on future sea level rise of six feet, um, that's our resiliency plan's current game plan, is to start planning for a six-foot rise. Uh, it's, it's unofficial, but we're, we're, we're trying to make that more official with, with our own current regulations. Uh, that's, that's in the works. So they looked at six-foot rise, and then I asked them, um, what storm event would, would it take to have the mirror map back up into our lower artichoke? They came back with a 14-year storm. So if anyone drives by a 113 and they look at the dam and they see the, uh, the downstream of the dam, they see the Merrimack River this far from the top of the dam, that's what we're talking about. It's not that far to go before you get over the dam. Um, so they estimate about a 14-year storm event from the river backing up. Um, as part of that, they just have to analyze the basins. This is just a graphic to show you the different sub-basins. And this is just a graphic just to show you, um, you know, one end result. This was at 25. They, they, they did many storm events, I think like uh, 12 different storm events. Um, so this is a 25-year frequency storm. It shows the breach, shows the water coming from the Merrimack into our supply. and. That's where we're here. We need to prevent that. So this um, kind of speaks for itself. This is their 
breach analysis. And it, you know, it goes and it, it extends pretty far. In their analysis, um, I mean, there is hundreds of th hundreds of thousands of gallons, and then eventually millions of gallons that makes its way in. I mean, it's not a small issue. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, it's a big deal. So our number one priority um, is to um, protect our water supply from good getting breached from the mayor mayor. So um, like I said, first thing we have to protect on the spillway is prevent a breach. Um, until we uh, build the higher dam, we need temporary controls. And we we need to do sandbags. So good news, we don't have to deal with the 80 pound sandbag, they have better technology, bigger bags. So uh, we employ SuperSacks out on Reservation Terrace and it just takes a conventional backhoe uh, to drop them in. Uh, so it's pretty basic on the up, up, upstream side of the spillway. Um, we can't just dump the bags in the water you lose the fabric and all this other stuff. So we need, and plus it'll take longer because you need more bags. We decided to come up with a foundation, just a stone foundation, and we're gonna place it upstream, shown in red, but a better graphic is the design that, we're, that we submitted to the West Newbury Conservation Commission for Northern Conditions to get this permitted. Um, this is what we're looking at. Essentially, it's a, it's, it's a ramp going down and the reason for the ramp, 15 feet wide, or 10 feet, um, is so that we can get the backwood down there. It's pretty basic, that's it. We just need the backwood to get down there, so it's just gravel, pretty simple. We also chose to extend the ramp on the other side so that Tom's guys can maintain the dam. It provides so much easier access, and um, this is, we're hoping to get this permitted and get it built soon, because we're in the middle of hurricane season, so we're working on that. This is what the permanent uh, dam could look like. And again, it's very conceptual. Um, option one protects the West Newbury well field, which is in the lower left part of the graphic. Um, they, part of their water supply is that well field right there. So um, with sea level rise, the waters will eventually reach that well field. We've met with them. Uh, we've met with uh, Mike, the water super uh, at the time. Uh, still there. Uh, and they have to do their own evaluation on their own protection. But once we get into this design, we'll work with them. And we just, both communities just have to figure out uh, the benefit of protecting their well field or not. Option two is just putting the dam where it is now. And, um, we can do it much shorter. We can uh, tie it into the to the hill. Frankly, I don't know why they went 4,300 4, feet. They should have just tied it into the hill. Uh, so I think this will be fine. And we'll get it permitted by um, DCR. Uh, this is just a, a, a better graphic of option one. And what option one does is it'll actually result in higher reservoir levels, possibly, possibly, depending on the dam can be higher, but we can still let water flow. So we can have a higher dam to protect us from the flood waters coming from the Merrimack, but we can have a pipe system so we keep we maintain a lower water level. This is all stuff that we have to work with, work Tom's guys and myself if, if a, and our engineers to work with DCR to get that permitted. There's a, there's a few different ways of doing it. This is one way, uh, adjustable floodgates. Um, as you can see, I think it's self-explanatory, uh, those gates rotate. So the beauty of this is a storm event comes, we can raise it. Um, there's a lot of pros and cons with this, uh, you know, uh, maintenance is made out of steel. But what I like about it is it's flexible. And uh, if we do it right and we plan properly, 
um, it might you know it might be it might be the chosen preferred way. The last thing I want to say about this is um, there's a lot of analysis that goes along with flood control. Um, storms come from upstream of the inland from the reservoirs and flood from the Indian Hill downside. And then there's Merrimack River coastal storms that bring an ocean surge into our system. And then you can do a model of both. So the complexity of all this is um, the dam is, needs to be designed for different purposes. One is to prevent a surge from the ocean. The other is to prevent is to control flooding up, upstream. My preferred is to make the dam as high as possible. Now, don't even have adjustable gates. Keep it high, get better volume, but I'm not a water quality guy. I know the cost, DCR doesn't like to raise the water level. We will go through that. But I, like to, I, I would like to work with DCR to see if we can raise it now, and that way we don't have to deal with adjusting it in the future to be determined. Uh, we have, that, that's a five year exercise of design permitting, very long time. Uh, now we get into aquatics, which is, um, we got hit with a bloom last August. And these slides are just to show you what it looks like. This is a drone from Roger Street, looking south. Um, that's pretty much where it started. This is that area that's like two feet deep. And by nature, a lot of the watershed heads here first, so it, it collects, you know, there's been decades of runoff from all these developed areas that end up getting into our sediment. And, you know, every time I have a, combination, a, com a, a conversation with Tom's limnologist, I, I just I learn more and more. Uh, this will, you know, there's a lot that goes into algae blooms. I'm going to touch upon very little. Um, the good news is we have experts that are helping us out, and they know what they're doing. Um, but as you can see, it only took a couple weeks for it to take over the whole, uh, the upper, then the lower. It didn't reach our intake, and it didn't get toxic. So Tom and the Linology did a great job of controlling it. Um, if it happens again, I total faith that it'll, it'll be fine, it'll, it'll treat it, it'll be fine. The issue with treatment, I'm not going to talk, talk too much detail, but the issue with treatment, you can only do copper treatment so many times for so many years. You can't do it like 20 years in a row every single year. Um, so as a community, we need to work with West Newbury, our own community, part of Newbury. We've got to clean up the watershed, prevent runoff. So like I said, Don Kresper and Ken Wagner were the limnologists. Um, they really did a great job. Um, my takeaway from their report, um, which I think is suitable for a general takeaway for everyone, other people might have different takeaways, uh, phosphorus is the most likely nutrient for our system. Other systems might be nitrogen, but for us it's phosphorus. We have extremely high concentrations of phosphorus. The larger the watershed, <coughs> relative to the reservoir area, the more difficult it is to manage the reservoir quality through watershed management. That is where I cringe to think how we're going to work with West Newbury. West Newbury has been great working with us, um, but how we can work with another community, collectively 4,000 acres, and keep it Manually clean. This ratio is 95 to 1 for the lower artichoke. I don't have a number that's good. Like, I, I didn't call the analogy to say, hey, what's a good ratio? But Indian Hill is 4 to 1. So look at the math. Um, Indian Hill, 4 to 1, 95 to 1 for lower artichoke. That's a lot of land area dumping into our reservoir. So that scared me. Um, stormwater and alumnologists are making a point to emphasize and educate us that we need to be aware of that. Stormwater runoff, this is also from the, the report, 
uh, runoff from development, erosion, higher water temps, longer growing season, lower flushing rates due to prolonged droughts have the potential to increase the magnitude and duration of algae blooms, uh, algae growth now and in the future. The upper and lower artichoke reservoirs, they feel would be classified as eutrophic or highly productive for algae growth because the numbers are so high. Um, algae growth itself is a concern, not just from, it seems like it's a concern. There's good algae, by the way. There's, there is good algae. So, but too much algae, it, 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 Tom's got to do more treatment for too much algae. But there's good algae and bad algae. Um, the August was one of the bad ones. It's the green, blue, blue, green. It was the Dalacosperum crassum, formerly called in the banyan. Um, I know next to nothing about this stuff. Uh, it's a type of filamentaceous and um, when EPA gave a presentation to Tom's guys a couple weeks ago, um, this is up here with uh, uh, intensity of, of, of um, complexity and chemistry. There's a lot to it. So not every algae bloom turns toxic. We did, our bloom didn't turn toxic. Uh, from what I understand, only 20% of cyanobacteria blooms turn toxic. That's good news. Um, but you still have to treat it. They treat it with, the, the treatment of the day right now is copper um, treatment, and that worked out great. So, uh, Tom's guy sends out, Tom sends his guys out for um, sampling the water. This is, these are the locations that we current sample, currently sample. Um, this is a couple dozen. We're gonna start adding to them. Uh, what we need to start doing is document the results, start graphing everything out, pay attention to the results, um, keep that information available for the lunologists. The, lun the lunologists also use this study, which was the bathymetric study that we did. Um, not myself, but the water plant guys from 2017. Um, our, consultant AECOM, they hired this company to do, you, it's good to know what the water depths are, because when, when a limnologist wants to treat an algae bloom, they need to know how much volume it is. It's a recipe for, even, you need recipes for cooking, you need recipes for how much copper to put in the water. So that's what that is. Um, nitrogen, we all know sources of nitrogen, phosphorus, fertilizer, um, animal waste, and this one here, um, you know, we have to wrap our arms around how to work with West Newbury on this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then sources of nitrogen, phosphorus, and, path and pathogens for this uh, for septic system. So human waste is also a problem. Right now, um, the animal control, our animal control deals with Newbury Park and West Newbury, and they have a list of animals that they track. And right now we have about 23 horses, about 30 cattle in the watershed. And I just want, I just want you to see that. So all in all, um, if we lose our supply to an algae bloom, we need, we really need a plan B. The minute Tom realized he had a bloom, and we all got involved to help out. Um, I contacted Mass DOT, uh, both uh, Bechtel Parsons, the engineer, Mike Bertelin, uh, and also uh, District 4 to get on their radar that we gotta, we got to uh, get an emergency water line interconnect with Amesbury pronto, because if we lose our water, this is when the bloom just hit. At that time, we're like, we need this approved by you, so if we need to install it next week, not literally next week, but next month, we're ready to go. It's now a year later, we're still in the permitting phase. So everyone's like, why are you, ru John, why are you rushing it so much? And your type A personalities, you just slow down. I actually had a shotgun out and, and was trying to rush it, and we're still, we're still working on it. What that means is the bloom got treated. There's no longer a need for this. 
So we put it out on the shelf a little bit, but we still have been working with them. We're still working with them now. They, they want us to look at um, a better place to put it right now. Our proposal is in the bike path. This is the connection on our side of the water. Um, it's, it's pretty basic. Uh, it's, it's connect our side, lay a temporary line across the bridge to, a, to their water pipe in, um, on, on their side in um, Evans Place. Pretty basic. So if we install the manholes in the underground pipe connection now, just get them ready in the future, lift the manhole, and have a contractor install the temporary line, everyone's happy. So we're working with MassDOT on that. It requires working with Amesbury to get an agreement to agree to give us water. Uh, so they have to figure out how much water they're willing to give. Those negotiations are ongoing. Master T is ongoing. Plan C. This came straight from, um, Tom recommended this, asked Ty and Bond to look into this uh, for, the, for options for the report. Essentially, a water treatment operator um, can't live with our system as it is now uh, with, with any level of comfort because the water goes to Indian Hill, to the upper, to the lower. If any one of those gets, gets um, um, you know, impaired, we lose everything. This water line from Indian Hill will connect all three reservoirs by a pipe system. That way the operator can flip some valves, he can shut down the lower artichoke due to, due to a bloom, get water from the upper straight to our system, everyone's happy, you guys won't even see the hiccup, and we move on. The other thing that this water line does is you can mix and match. If we do it properly, there's a few snares that will make it uh, better than, than just doing one way from any help. But he may want to pump water from one of the lowers to the upper. However, he does his work to mix it. That's what he does. So that's what this is for. Small little price tag, but it's, <laughs> this, is, this is key. Uh, it, now we get into watershed protection, which is my least favorite. Um, public education. It's the most important, but um, it's kind of, it's nebulous, you can't really put your, wrap your arms around it, and you're relying on too many other people to help you do what you want to accomplish. So we all know that um, it's hard to have everyone help each other, help, help, help out the cause. Um, New Report has a water, water resource protection district right now. This is the map. That dotted line is the watershed. Our district can only be enforced in our town our city. So this map is a little bit misleading. We can't go over to West Newbury and say, hey, we have a district, a watershed protection district. Nope. So what we got to do is we've already met with um, Angus uh, and his staff, and they are more than willing to help us uh, help them create a, an overlay district or a watershed protection district. The method of doing it is just, that's just the detail. Um, so we're going to continue working with them. Why do we have to work with them? Again, three quarters of our watershed is in their town. 88% of the water is in their town, 75 land total, 76%. They have in existence a groundwater protection overlay district because they have groundwater supplies. Those are the wells. So the one on the top right is uh, the well that we talk about next to the lower water show. So they have a means of protecting their water supply uh, for the well. It's a little bit different protection, um, similar protection, but the offsets are different, zone A's versus zone ones. But they, they have that in place, but we need to expand it and create a, uh, our, our own overlay district in their town. Um, this is just a visual to have you see the watershed with just the streets and then the prop parcels. Um, I like it. It, it, it just kind of sticks out that, hey, there's a lot of development in the watershed. Um, that's the only reason for me showing the slide. Uh, some good news. Um, 
West Newbury is almost entirely zoned residential. So that's good news. If we can convince the owners and convince Home Depot to stop selling nasty fertilizers, then, then we can all win. There's no commercial and industrial parks in here. Um, this is something that the engineers look at. Um, anyone that's working on a watershed protection plan, you look at the land uses. And these are, this is information that comes from the G Mass GIS data layers. I put this together simply for, you can barely see it, but those dots are houses, and it just kind of gives you an approximation of what you're looking at. Uh, the attempt was in perfect areas. Um, so, uh, some more stats, homes, farms, commercial. So homes is like, you know, 277 homes in West Newbury in the watershed. They're all septic. So, if any of them fails, it, it, it only takes a few septic tanks to really cause some damage, not the balloon that we're talking here. But, um, you know, so 277, we got to make sure that we find a way to monitor to make sure that they're inspected properly. Uh, a lot of times they're only inspected when you sell the house. So we're going we're to work on that. Newbury has 54 homes with septic. Newbury Port, we have 230 homes in the watershed. So we have 230 homeowners that we have to worry, worry about dropping fertilizer and pesticides. But the sewer is less of a problem. Farms, West Newbury, 15 farms, Newbury Port, 9. Uh, farms are... They're big, uh, but we're, we aren't really sure if the farms are, you know, the root cause of the full algae bloom. Um, I think it's a combination of everything because, you know, all in all, there's only like 30 cattle in West Newbury. Is that enough to cause it? Eh, it's not good. It's, you know, um, the artichoke dairy, they had some negative press. Uh, just, it was just trying to get the right press out. Uh, it, it, it tilted a little bit. We don't really think that the artichoke dairy was the main cause. It, this is decades of everyone adding to their own little thing. Uh, but farms we will look at. West Newbury, uh, I'm sorry, uh, commercial, there's only two lots in, um, there's only two commercial lots uh, in the watershed. The uh, state wheat barracks and the other one on Scalp Road. What's the best way to protect the watershed? Buy the land. Essex County Greenbelt is phenomenal in this area. They, they really are. They just helped acquire 38 acres of the, it, the Rogers family. Don't know if anyone knows them. I do not. They sold the land to Essex County um, for purposes of conservation, so kudos to them. Uh, Greenbelt helped uh, acquire funds from many sources. Kudos to West Newbury, Newbury Park, DCR, Fields Pond Foundation, uh, and so you can see you can see it up a million dollars of, of financial support. Um, that was very healthy. Our planning department filed the drinking water supply grant, so they did a good job filing that for the three hundred thousand um, dollars. So it's, it's, it's a joint effort and. I have Vanessa Johnson Hall on there because, um, from my vantage point, um, you know, Tom worked with her to help acquire the Rogers and also 117 um, Indian Hill Street. Um, and Tracy got helped out with uh, uh, some, some uh, you know, the logistics of, of, of that, the benefits of that. Um, she really does a really good job. I wanted her to get some credit. Um, so these are the properties in West Newbury owned by Essex County. They have already been buying land for years. So when you see someone from Essex County Greenbelt, let them know that you thank them. That's a lot of land. Um, these are city-owned properties. Um, Self-explanatory. City-owned properties in West Newbury. We own them in West Newbury. So we own under the Indian Hill, but we don't own under the Artichoke, the Artichoke Reservoirs. But we have rights to the water, and um, but we don't own the land, so it's kind of very interesting. Now, for the last year and a half with Taiban, 
during that process, we get a phone call, and um, it, Kate Mallory is a grad student, a Harvard grad student who lives in Amesbury, and she asked if she could, if there's a project that we had that she could uh, work on for her sustainability work. And I said, sure. Um, why don't you work out the nutrient loading maximums coming off the land use? And um, she was all over it. So she put together this plan. I'm only going to give you a couple slides. I'm only showing you this because algae blooms get really, really thick. And to treat that with filters is not easy. This, I'm not going to keep this slide up because I don't want you to regurgitate the numbers, Jenna, because it, it, there's a reason that her, her work and effort was, from a, was very, very rough. And I don't want people to take away. What you look at is um, the USDA and other agencies have allowable amounts of nutrients that can go into your water body. I'm not going to bore you, but essentially what she did is she calculated hey, we have a water body that's this big. How many pounds of phosphorus can that water body receive before it turns bad? There's calculations for that. She came up with an answer. Um, you know, many pounds are coming off this 4,000 acres. Many, many, many hundreds and thousands, many thousands of pounds coming off the watershed. Then she does a calc of what the watershed is capable of surviving, and those numbers are much different. So I don't want to alarm anyone, but moving forward, we're, we can use those numbers to know what land uses to go after. Um, she came up with a whole bunch of the six main items to consider. Rainwater harvesting, we know that. Uh, widening the riparian buffer zone. This I grabbed from the University of Tennessee. Uh, website. I, it, when you Google, you just come up. I, I wanted um, riparian zone uh, graphics, and this came up. This is perfect. You want to keep everything away from the stream. That's the zone A is the closest to the stream. That's in this view. The zone one is like the zone A. The zone two is really the zone B, but zone B includes zone A. Too much information. Um, Right now, we have too many livestock and too many animals that are on the water in West Newbury. They just need to be educated. We want to work with them. We want to come up with a way to, you know, this nutrient management plan on the left. Um, we can work with farmers. The USDA has a, a, a ton of information. We contacted the USDA for the artichoke dairy farm. They went out. They helped them. And I don't know the exact end result, but I think we all achieved what we wanted. They put the fence up and they keep it away. Um, they keep their cows away and everything's doing well. Um, there's more to be done because we know more. We're going to meet with all the farmers and come up with a, help come up with a nutrient management plan. That's our goal. Um, animal waste storage, you can't just leave it on the ground. Critical planting areas, uh, the one on the left. Uh, rotational grazing, the one on the right. Uh, she also threw in a whole bunch of other things. You can do floating wetlands, the lower left. You can actually, and I, I, I'm not sure if this will ever come about, but for storm surge folks like yourself, I know you love this stuff. Um, it's got a lot of, you know, there's a lot of benefit with that. Um, if it all takes a lot of nutrients, what do you do with that plant? So I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, you can also do solar panels on the water. That creates shade, keeps it from getting less hot. Um, I like that one myself. Floating solar panels, that would be cool. But we got to clean up the uh, clean, clean up after the horses. Uh, community education, real quick. This is all standard brochure stuff. Um, what can you do? Once this is published and on the website, you can go to it. But you can go just about anywhere, but I'll tell you right now, stop using um, petroleum-based fertilizer. Just stop doing it. Um, keep your septics, anyone, from, anyone that has septic, 
keep it tight, make sure it's working. Uh, and then everything else is just kind of common sense. Um, you know, th there's stuff about washing the tire and all that. Um, I think the biggest thing is the fertilizer. And, and, and your animals, and, and your own animals. Keep your own animals, pick it up in, in the backyard and throw in the garbage. I have this because we need to keep in mind um, this is for you, uh, climate change people. It's for me. I'm a tree hugger. I get so bogged down by the news of how bad climate change is going to be. Um, working with these guys, take, they get me out of that. Right? So it, it, there is a lot of good things we can do instead of just accepting the fact that we're going to you know, have a lot of trouble. Um, so you can't let fear get in the way. So what we have to do is piecemeal it and make improvements. It's not going to happen overnight. Obviously, we all wish we could. The reason why I say that is and I'm using all her slides because she hit everything spot on. If we do nothing, that's like we did nothing for climate change all these years. Now we're spending billions of dollars in cleanup. Well, we can't continue to do nothing. So even though you don't like to see an Indian Hill line or raise the dam, doing nothing is a lot worse. Uh, affordable animal waste, we can work with farmers. Hey, there's a place in, uh, where is that town? Haverhill? Yeah. Place in Haverhill that takes your waste and it turns into energy. I mean, there's so many things we can do. All right, so we're at the last uh, couple slides. Um, the immediate action is to, is to get the time bond report, distribute it, let people review it. We need to install the stone, stone foundation for the spillway. We need to do that right away. Um, number three, we need to finalize the emergency interconnect with Amesbury. And hopefully we can get that done in the next couple months. Um, probably longer because we agreements with communities and figuring out exactly how much water you're willing to give up is a sensitive subject. So we have to continue to work on that. DOT, I think we can eventually get to a satisfactory design. Um, and then install the connection to both sides so that when push, when the time comes, we can just install it. We do need a raw water line in our opinion. Time bonds opinion report will show it. Um, the, the raw water line is so important. It provides the ability of tapping into one of the three without losing all three. Um, this is a big one. We need to hire a watershed protection manager. Whatever title you want to give this person. Tom is too busy. I'm too busy. Um, you know, the mayor's office is, it, it, the, new, the current mayor, the, any mayor, they're all too busy. If we had a designated person, I am convinced they would be busy full time, helping create the bylaw, monitoring the pollutant loadings, go out there and do the samples, uh, create policies and procedures for enforcement, do enforcement, work with the property owners to get grants. Uh, you can get grants that we can work with them, move the horses off the stream, put up a fence, build a shed, build an awning, uh, put the manure in the, uh, underneath the awning. There's a lot of things we could do, and I sympathize with them because they've been doing it for years. I don't sympathize if they give us a hard time and say, nope, I'm not changing because we have we can help them. We can get the money for the for the for, for, for the shed, and we get the money for the fence. Uh, there's grant money for that. Now that said, and I think it's safe for me to say that because it's just my opinion. <laughs> it would behoove us, right, Mary? It would it would behoove us to actually pay for some of these improvements and to keep buying land versus dealing with the treatment and the end result of all the toxins coming our way. So for a little help of each property owner, giving them what they need, to me that's a chump change. Um, short and long term, the, the one before was immediate. This is short and long term. Um, we got to raise the dam. Um, speaks for itself. 
controls, sea level rise, impact, we'll work with DEP. Install, physically install the Indian Hill Water Pool, for our water line. Uh, purchasing more land is, is key. Uh, we gotta continue that. We are, Essex County is always continuing it. Um, the city is always willing to continue it. Uh, collectively, we just need that person to help out facilitate it. And then we gotta stop the nutrients, number four, stop the nutrients from um, wreaking havoc on our system. The other thing that I didn't talk about, but it's there, is the sediment in the reservoirs, they're laden with nutrients from decades of receiving the nutrients. So we need to do some spot evaluation, find out where the hot zones are, and start dredging those out. Uh, the reason for that, uh, believe it or not, I'm sure you believe everything at this point, um, the nutrients from the sediment get released into the water under certain conditions. When the water gets, to, when the oxygen is not perfect and it's out of balance, the nutrients get sucked in by, by the water sucks up the nutrients. So we need the dissolved oxygen to stay where we want it, but that is not an easy task, so we probably won't succeed on keeping the pH, it's not a swimming pool, we, we, we are probably won't succeed to keep, in keeping the chemistry of the water perfect so removing the toxins in the, in, the, in the nutrients in the sediment is a good idea. Um, we need a, per, a permanent interconnect. Um, an interconnect for permanent source for emergency purposes. But we also need someone to, and this is where outside consultants come in, we need to find more sources of water. Um, nothing to worry about, it's just that every community needs to find more sources of water. They're all doing the same thing. West Newbury's, everyone is always looking for more sources of water. So you read the paper, um, you just, it's a continual effort. So we will need to continue to do that, both in our town and in neighboring towns. Even if, as far away as Haverhill, because it only takes a, a, a pipeline to have interconnects between communities. And then lastly, um, or consider upgrades to the treatment plant to provide um, enhanced treatment for removal of nutrients, toxins, algae, taste and odors. Um, so that'll be another thing that we have to look at. Um, that is it. Um, so we're gonna have the three of us come up here and Heather, you, Heather. do you want them to speak in a mic? So I'm going to raise the screen, and I'm going to some applause. I'm going to stay up here in case maybe we can go back to the slide, but otherwise I'll field the questions and uh, chances are most questions will go to Dr. Tracy. No, uh, just like to make an observation. Um, how long has Lower Arachar Dam been in place? Uh, lower, um, I believe the 1910s, the early 1900s. Okay. Um, well, has it either, either either the lower or the upper upper was uh, at that. I, I tried to find the, those plans before this presentation, but I couldn't get my hand up. Well, it's been there a long, long, long time. time. Has it ever overtopped to your knowledge from the Merrimack River? To our knowledge, um, the closest it came was the Mother's Day storm. Yep. And talking to the prior plant operator and some staff people, um, they, didn't, they didn't see it overtop. And if it only overtops a little bit, your upland flow will push that down, uh, but that was that was pretty close. Okay. The general observation from people was it was pretty close. Well, because the other the other thing is the statistical analysis. I guess you're saying before, it's about a 14 year event on the Merrimack would cause an over overtopping of the lower artichoke. So if it hasn't been overtopped. Boy, if you dodged the bullet, luckily, somehow. I mean, that, that's, that's extremely critical. Ex 
extremely. And yeah. okay. I just want to make that observation. I think we've lucked out. It's probably over top and nobody knew it. Uh, actually, if I can say something, I, I believe that um, in the, it was the 1938, the flood of 1938, um, I, I'm from West Newbury, and I believe on our uh, Climate Change Resiliency Committee website that there's a uh, uh, clipping, a, a you know, copy from a Mac, uh, Daily News article from that time um, discussing the, um, that area being completely flooded and the Merrimack, therefore, would have backed up in, into the reservoir. Into the now, reservoir. I, I, I read the article a year ago, and I don't recall the details, but I think you can find that, um, on, that on that website. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I might add, Bill Mullen is, is a member of the Resilience Committee. He's also a hydraulic, hydrology engineer. Um, and he is the type of guy that does these h and studies. Um, so it's very, HA studies in, in hydrology is very tricky because, as Bill knows, it, you're dealing with is it coming from the ocean backup? Is it coming from upstream down? If you have the upstream pushing it down and the, the backup isn't so bad, maybe the upstream water is pushing down. I agree. We've been lucky so far. Yeah, I agree. And, and I'll just add the concern too has been sea level rise. So that, that's where your 14 year story comes in if you add that sea level rise because as things start coming up, you're more likely to see an overtopping event at, at a lower storm. But the 14 year is for a present day um, sea levels. That was for present day, yeah. yep, mean high, high water from flooding the flooding of the Merrimack back in. And, and from an operations standpoint, we're all there daily. So we're, we're monitoring it every day. Can you just, um, let me make sure I got this right, right? We've got it, it's a 14 year potential. We dodged a bullet for a long time. We got the plans for putting in a temporary uh, sandbag routine. What's the timing between now and that temporary protection being in place? So, um, right now, for the foundation for the sandbag system, where it's being permitted with the uh, Conservation Commission in West Newbury, because that is actually in West Newbury. Uh, we you just said that was five year process? Um, no, that's, that's for the, 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 the full dam reconstruction to raise the dam. So, yeah. all this is the temporary measure. We just have to file with MEPA now because we expanded the size of it. Uh, that'll be a few more weeks, but the installation of that foundation should be this year. That should be this year. The five year is design permitting, just design and permitting for, uh, for the dam. It'll take a long time to get both communities and DCR, Office of Dam Safety. And we're gonna turn it over to Trace, this is your value right Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, looking at the dam, so, there's two issues. There's the spillway um, that you saw and, and you can see from the roadway, and then there's the embankment. So the spillway is approximately three to four feet below the 100-year floodplain, or far, the 100-year um, storm event elevation. The embankment is right about at the 100-year um, storm event. So the idea is that we could raise the embankment, bring it out to shorten the embankment of the dam, because right now it's 4,300 linear feet. So that's a long stretch of embankment to maintain and make sure that that's still structurally um, stable. So the idea would be to raise the embankment at this point, but keep the spillway um, approximately where it is so you're not raising the water level, but then you have something like the crest gate, which is what John Eric showed a picture of, so that there's um, flexibility with the system to bring that up so that you have a barrier between the waters coming up from the Merrimack and the reservoir system. I think the longer term plans you're outlaying are uh, excellent. My concern is this window 
for the catastrophe, and you're saying we've got a window of about six months, right? Yeah. And in that window, if we got notice next week, what do we do? Well, I think you drop back and punt, right? I mean, you <laughs> try to go ahead and do the best you can with what you have. And if we don't actually have a full foundation, we talked about possibly using those super sacks, those larger bags, and um, maybe half filling them so they would drape over the, the existing dam that's there. So I mean, there's things that we could do, obviously in a pinch. I think what you're seeing from, from the standpoint of that foundation is an ideal situation. So, um, so for six months, <coughs> couldn't we just flesh out that draping over of the sandbag plan? Like, have we got the bags? Have we got the sand? Do we know where we're going to put them? How are we going to move them in? Yeah, we've already had contractors in. We've got a we've already had a crane guy in. And we talked about a laid out area. Um, so yeah, it's, the wheels are always turning. They never, they never stop. Um, is it written? Is what written? The temporary plan for the next six months. It's not currently in our um, ERP. It's not. No. But you bring up a good point. I mean, David Chatfield is the uh, one of the co-chairs of the Resiliency Committee, um, and as you can see, it's. Uh, question is very similar to how he ran the committee. Uh, he wants answers. So um, I think, Tom, I think I, 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 what we need to do, if we get a hurricane warning for next week, Tom's already talked to the contractor. I'm just rewording what you said to give him total assurance because I know how his brain thinks. Um, we're going to dump sit those loop super sacks into the water body and tell anyone that cares, DEP, local concom, we have to do this, and that's what we'll do. Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, that's pretty much what we talked to the contractor about, um, you know, getting the sandbag, getting the system. I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm just saying, okay. you know, it's six months, and SOD's law says it's going to happen, even though we've had many, many, many years of it not over talking. And I would just document it a little bit to, so that we all agree that's that's the way we're going to go. Yeah, no, it's fair. I mean, it's a fair question for sure. Um, like I said, we've always taken the approach that we knew that this was going to be a very large project. We knew that it was going to be a lot of money for the long term. And we knew that we had to have it broken down just like he showed it. That short term, long term, and immediate. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Um, really appreciate all the information that you presented tonight, but I think one of the things that is of concern is that we probably need millions and millions of dollars to implement everything that you have identified. And so I'm asking Amy in terms of the tie-in bond report that you're putting together, are you going to prioritize for us and price out estimates of this should happen within six months, a year, two years, three years? Are you giving us so a little more direction in terms of how we should proceed. But if you talk about land purchases, we're in the process of doing some of that. But you, you know, in terms of dredging hot spots in the river, I mean, that's a very expensive project, as we know, as we're trying to dredge the Merrimack River. And then you've got you know upgrades to the treatment plan in terms of dealing, being able to deal with toxins that come in before we're able to address you know the kinds of things, uh, raising the level, raising the spillway, raising the dam, water supply across. I mean, all of these um, projects are incredibly expensive. I mean, I think originally we talked about the pipe coming from Indian Hill was $10 million. I mean, the only good thing about um, is that we're putting this all together so that we understand what we need to do going forward and the fact that there is, you know, Brazilians of ARPA money and one of the areas, one of the buckets they've identified is water supply and protection. So this is an opportunity for us to really pay attention to infrastructure grants that could be coming down from the state and be in, but I, I really would like us to work together to put together a, a priority plan, what realistically we can do. And we've identified a lot of things we need, but we don't have $100 million to do all these things. 
And so how do we, you know, so I think we need help from Ty and Vaughn and, you know, our team, Resiliency Plan and Storm, whoever, to put together uh, a plan that we can begin to prioritize and tick off grants and funding to address all of these really important uh, solutions for the city yeah. and the West area. Um, so, uh, it's important for everyone to know, when I got asked to put this presentation together, it was based on climate change, and I wanted to do that. Um, the disadvantage is that we're in the time in the middle of this report. So a lot of what the mayor just heard, she, some of the things she just heard for the first time, because we're in the middle of this report. So uh, we have a lot of, we still have a lot to finish. We gotta finish the cost estimating, because our plan, that was, that was the bullet up I, I had up there, Mayor, is we gotta get the report up to the stakeholders, which is you, the Water and Sewer Commission. We still have, you know, we still have, we still have to roll it up to you. And I, I wanna assure, I, I have to assure you that that's what our goal is right now. Um, so, with the cost estimate, um, I don't think we have that in the contract, but that is something we do. We do have estimates for the type of the raw water transmission line, as you mentioned, that is a big ticket item. We have cost estimates for um, some of the dam improvements that were shown there, the different options for extension of that. Um, there are some, some things that um, were outside of our purview, so water treatment plant um, uh, upgrades for, for that. ACOM has been working on, on the water treatment plant, so we don't have those type of estimates within our, um, our report. But you know we have recommendations as to you know we looked at a number of options like you know John Eric had on the screen I think we had six or seven different options for the water transmission line and so we have a recommendation for that um, we have a recommendation for the the dam work um, there are some things that can happen concurrent um, with your partners. So, but to your point, it does make sense to get, you know, the partners to the table and have that discussion. So, um, you know, Essex Greenbelt has done an amazing job in, you know, just the year and a half that we've been working on this project with acquiring additional properties with the help of Newberry Port and West Newberry, um, you know, pulling funds together to acquire lands within the watershed. Um, there are, you know, some options for, having like these kind of, kind of conversations and letting people know what their actions on their properties can do that kind of help, you know, so like say some of the piecemeal, but some of the bigger infrastructure projects, you're absolutely right. It's, um, you know, we can provide some input on prioritization, but you know, there's a few other pieces that are kind of mulling about that aren't in our report that need to be incorporated into overall planning for the community. How soon do you think you'll have your um, so we have a draft into John Eric at this point for kind of final review and comments okay. um, for Great. to get back to us. So wonderful, thank you. All right, um, I've heard two things, and you, this is great to really put this together in a holistic way to be able to look forward. But the what David was talking about, I think, is pretty germane to the situation because. It's a contingency plan should hurricanes come at us real soon. Is that in writing so that that can be understood of who's going to do what and when? Is that? Yeah, that's what Tom is. But having it in writing so people can understand. Richard can make a report on it, and here's what's going to happen. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. I mean, so right now, this is, this is such a moving target. And I couldn't give everyone, I couldn't give the mayor an update on everything that's going on in our head. Uh, Tracy and I just talked about a bunch of things yesterday and today that, that changed things on what we're doing and on the report. Uh, as far as that, everything, we're, we're, we're just waiting to finish everything. And yes, there's certain things that have to be done. We can't wait for, you know, can't wait for certain game planning. We have to do things simultaneously. We're doing the best we can. We're, we're very, we are short staffed, uh, but if you could, they're asking if you can get that in here. Would that be the ERP? Yeah, we can go ahead and put it and make it part of the ERP. Yes, yeah. that's not a problem. Yeah, that'd be great. 
Charlie Tucker. Yeah, thank you. Um, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, the two most urgent pieces are one, connecting to an emergency water supply in Amesbury, and two, raising the dam. Uh, would you want to prioritize one of those over the other? And do you have rough estimates of cost? If you had one to two million dollars so to spend in the next year, could you do it? Yeah, so I, I mean, I really think the emergency interconnection is, is the insurance policy because it, it gives the city the ability, if it, if it needs to, to connect to another community to take that water in. Um, there are some moving parts there, obviously, from a negotiation standpoint, and you know, that, that, that would have to be worked out. But um, I mean, DEP always wants that kind of connection. They're always looking for that. Um, we've, had, we've had a little bit of experience with that when, prior to me coming here. Um, I was working in Groveland, and when they were doing some of the upgrades here, they needed to have that redundancy. So at that particular time, um, we worked with the engineers and we were able to go ahead and figure that the hydraulic grade line was such that we could wheel water through West Newberry to here. Um, but that, again, becomes whatever the, that current situation, uh, the current situation now is not the situation that I had when I was there. And I know just because I left there and I'm in contact with them, they don't really have that extra water at this point. So it's about, you know, coming up with that, I think, because that really becomes more of that, you know, insurance that if something did hit the fan, you, you do, you, you have it. You know, all these things may be coming in as phases. You know, you might not do the whole project at once. You know, you may look at the Indian Hill project, you might say, well, let's just get an intake to the next dam and let's prioritize that mm -hmm. in conjunction with maybe possibly um, upgrades that need to happen at the water treatment plant because those are things that weren't in the work that Ty and Bond did and, and they're very important. So it's a pretty dynamic situation. I can tell you the two years that I've been here, it's, it's been a ride. It's been really, uh, it's been really fun, you know, but it's, but it's, it's been a challenge. So, um, you know, prior to that algal bloom, you know, it's been 10 years since the city experienced an algal bloom. You know, do we have anything on record that says that the Merrimack River came back in? To the, no, we don't. Can it happen? Yeah, it can. So I think it's about weighing all that out, trying to, um, put that all together and, and have discussions and, <coughs> and figure out what actually makes sense, you know, where the city is going to get its most bang for the buck, um, you know, what's available, you know, the mayor's been very supportive in, in, in trying to make sure that any funds that are available are able to come in to us and, so that we can talk about that and, and uh, make the expansions where we think it, it needs to be. Um, so it's, um, you know, from the first time that we started this project, um, We've had other things that have come up that have pushed us looking more towards the water treatment plant too. So, you know, it's a little bit of everything. Um, and like the mayor mentioned, I mean, it's a lot of money and we don't, you know, nobody has a blank check. And this still be arguing, I guess, on at the, at the government level, at the higher level, whether or not they're gonna let out even more money. So um, we have to work with what we have and uh, try to make the decisions that are gonna pay the dividends back to the city. So my takeaway from that is the emergency link to Amesbury would have priority. Right? I, I think it. I think it's. I think everything kind of happens simultaneously. You try to keep that all rolling. There's a commitment that we do all of it, and um, but we do we do meet regularly. We talk about where we need to go with the next steps, and um, but yeah, I, I do think that's a really good insurance policy. As far as you know. Not springing out the line, but actually having those connections there, I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense. If they're willing to give us if, the water. Exactly. Yeah. If, if, if they're willing. for that line and then say, oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the cumbersome part. And that's, quite frankly, out of my hands. So, more of the operation. I've got kind of probably a more technical question. Um, I don't know what kind of bottles are, but uh, analysis, you know, using, uh, Box models, mass balance, uh, fancy uh, numerical methods, whatever. Did you consider uh, any, anything as far as groundwater saturation in doing this? In other words, uh, I, I don't know if you're bringing rainfall in or if you're just taking volumes of water, but I've noticed over the last couple of years that uh, 
when we get rain, we get it in sequences, and, 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 uh, and the ground gets saturated. And so when you get one of these worst case scenarios, I don't remember how you did, I mean, 26 or 20 some scenarios. Uh, anyway, if you took one of those worst case scenarios, what if the, what if the groundwater couldn't have, if the ground couldn't absorb anything, and everything that fell went straight into the, into the system? Yeah, I, I, I'll say I'm not a rain engineer, but Typically, if we're looking at rainwater events, but not groundwater saturation. So, okay. So it's just it's it's, it's, it's just so it's just water into the system. Um, um, yes and no. Okay. I can handle that much. So, I'm a general civil engineer, and I, I know enough about uh, hydrology as far as what you're talking about. Um, TR20, TR55. These are programs that look at evapotranspiration. Right. Um, it looks at uh, you know absorption and in, in filtering into the ground. All of that is part of the model. So to answer your question, you start with generally, I believe, Bill, maybe you can correct me, he's an H&H &H guy, uh, but it starts with normal dry soil. And as the soil, the storm event happens, over a 72 hour period, the evaluation comes into place where uh, there's certain, the, the formula, certain amounts get into the soil, mm -hmm. sure. and then once it's saturated, it runs off. On a flip side, I've always been interested to do a, a, a hydrocad model for my projects on a, on, a, on a development in the dead of winter. Ground's frozen. Yeah, same kind. Ground's frozen. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Hydrologists and hydraulic, hydro, hydraulic engineers and civil engineers, we don't do that. Um, we could, but that's a rare event. So what you do is you try to design for a normal event, uh, but yes. What's well, becoming normal? No, but that, <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's why I was asking because. It's an excellent point. I just, yep. my, for the last five years, my lawn's been green. And for the previous time I owned that property, uh, by the end of July into August, it was brown, and so the ground the ground is wet, and we're getting we're getting you know multiple storms a week, and these days it's not a half an inch, it's two inches. Uh, just I'm just wondering, guess so. But if you do have that parameter, you can just set it at zero. We we could zero we, goes we into could always ground. ask our engineers to consider saturated soil. They would yeah. change the runoff rates, the CN coefficients, coefficients, and, and, and make it happen. Yeah. Uh, there's benefits. There's obviously it may benefits. be a small fat fraction I, of, of the of the of, you know what, the impact. Maybe. Well, but that, that that I will defer to them uh, yeah. because uh, civil engineering I've learned is in, in, in the training in school um, it's a balance of, of of trying to keep the cost down and getting value for what you're doing. Otherwise, if you design everything over if you over design everything, some people would consider that an over design. Is the, the, the chance of it really happening? However, this is a climate change world. Maybe it is more common. So that is a point. Well taken. Yeah. You know, and, if, if, if it's in, yeah. and if you could do a you know simple analysis, just look how much went into the ground. Yeah. If it's a small fraction of the total. Forget it. Yeah. And if it's sizable or reasonable yeah. fraction, then then maybe you should run one more. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we can do that. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, uh, how confident are we that Hainsbury has water to share? Oh, we've met with them, Tom, I think that? Yeah, I mean, it's, the first talks is when the, the boom actually happened. So at that point, it was heightened, right? You know, what can you do? How can you help us? Um, so at that point, it was, uh, you know, kind of very low level, and then it graduated up towards the mayor, and both mayors discussing it. Um, and it was, um, uh, for lack of a better word, a handshake. At this point, there's nothing in writing. So, that, you know, the mayor's correct in the fact that, you know, we, we don't have that document that says that they're willing to go ahead and give us the water. But we're, we're currently in the talks um, trying to figure out whether or not they can go ahead and, um, and, and supply us the water. The number that they threw out was a really good number. Um, and then after some further discussion, just they, they wanted to go back and forth and, and expand on those talks. So right now, sitting here today, I can't say that we're going to get it 100%. And for how long would we 
have that one. And that's the point, you know. I mean, and that's and that's really what I think the um, you know the directors have to discuss, you know. So we've talked with our engineer, and um, you know, that was absolutely you know, part of the question, yeah. the duration of having that. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's not easy, you know. Um, obviously, if it's a if it's a real dire emergency, you're going to be doing what you can. You're going into a massive conservation restriction. Um, you know, we do have other supplies. You know, we do have groundwater supplies that we can tap into. Um, but it's it, it wouldn't be easy. You know, are you stringing a line out and, you, and you're getting up to that upper artichoke or something like that? Um, because really, the lower artichoke seems to be the one that is problematic as far as um, priority and where you're going to get the, in, the influence from the, uh, the Merrimack River. So, you know, um, yeah. Will all be back to? Um, we have a comprehensive ERP now, and um, you know we just went ahead and went through an RRA, um, so risk and resiliency analysis with the EPA. Part of that process is to, by the end of this year, we have to update our ERP, so that will be done. Um, you know, it's just it's constant all the time; uh, it never stops. So, um, yeah, we're you know we're always looking to try to make sure that we have that that backup. And, um, you know, right now, unfortunately, this community, um, you know, you can't throw that switch. It's not that easy. Let me, let me add that the slide is slides can be misleading, but I tried to do a good job on presenting a temporary connection for the emergency, which could happen tomorrow, and then a permanent. Do you want to talk quickly that uh, we do, you, you always wanted to do uh, seek new sources with other communities, just real briefly, because you know that when you talk to Hansbury, uh, they may want to, they may need our water. So right now, Tom's been working with them, the hydraulic ray line is such that they can send it to us without any additional pumping. But if we want to share our water with them, that's a possibility. But that's called a more permanent connection. That has to be evaluated. And that goes in, can you take it over from there? Well, you get the Merrimack River between you. So yeah. you know the only way to get there is go underneath, right. um, and that's not that's not really that's feasible. Um, is it doable? Absolutely, but you know, is that a, you know a fifteen million dollar or twenty million dollar proposition? At that all. point, you know, are you sharing costs with the neighboring community? Yeah. Are they interested in that? Yeah. You know, I can't answer that question. Just, you know, it, really it, it feels like a stopgap solution as opposed to you mentioned yourself that we have other resources that could be developed and. You know, the energy should really be there. Yeah, you know, the takeaway should be that the report is a lot of water. Yeah. If the configuration was such that it was switched around, yeah. You know, you 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 have um, you may, might have a better better scenario. Yeah. You know, essentially the, the history of the way that the system is set up, um, I believe the upper artichoke was there first, and it was basically just a flooded pasture. Yeah. So a lot of those nutrients that are already there. They were there. They didn't remove it. They didn't strip the land. Um, then I think the other dam went in. The lower dam went in, and that got expanded. And then the city decided to. They went through an exercise of uh, flooding, extensive flooding, in much higher dams, and that didn't pan out. And then they ended up with the Indian Hill solution, where that actually got all ex excavated out. And um, you know, that, that's 80% of the total surface water supply is at Indian Hill. So keep that in retrospect. That that's you know. But, but the problem is the recharge. So the recharge and those numbers that John Eric was showing you, that 95 to 1 or that 4 to 1, you know, that flushing rate and that, and that recharge is much quicker at the upper and the lower than it is at Indian Hill. But the honey hole is Indian Hill. We just we don't have a pipe to get there. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of what is mentioned. Um, you know, I, I get this question all the time, you know, what, what would you do? Well, if I had a blank checkbook, I think we'd do it all, right? I think <laughs> that's what you want to do, is you want to go ahead and you want to build that. As an operations guy, that's what I want, right? I want to be able to respond to the questions and say, yeah, you know what, if I can't get it here, I'm going over there. And I think the city's done a good job at that. It's just with climate change, and you all, you know, you folks understand that, you know, it's, you got to change, right? You got to roll with it, you got to, you got to try to do what's best for the city, not just for us sitting here, it's the kids, right? It's later on. And their kids. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's that's what's really important. So my takeaway is 
you know, protect what you have, number one, because you don't want to lose it, and then, and then expand on that the best that you can that's going to pay the dividends back to the city. Hi. Uh, just the, your, your temporary solution with the sandbags, uh, the, the white sandbags. Um, I live on Plum Island, right in front of that section where they were used and put in place. I think it's, it's, it's very important that you build that um, stone platform to put them on so they have a solid footing. Because if you just put them in on the sediment, they'll just bury themselves into the sand. Exactly what happened out, out on Plum Island. Um, they, they're so heavy and they're so cylindrical that the, the weight of the bag will just they'll just settle right into the sediment. So it, uh, I would prioritize the building of that platform first, the, the, the stone platform, because if you don't, um, the, the bags will be there for, for for five minutes and then they'll start to sink into the sediment. Thank you very much. Um, as far as hooking into Amesbury, uh, Tom and I, there's a question we had. Um, we did a pump test from Haverhill through Brooklyn to Westonbury, and it was quite complicated, but it can be done. But there would be a lot of residents uh, that would probably have some issues there. Um, instead of going under the river, is there a possibility on this shallowest bridge, which is the chain bridge from Amesbury to Newburyport, to put a temporary line? on the bridge so that you can move water from there in an emergency situation. That would be a lot less cost to the report and at least it's there to hook up to and get it going from wherever it might be, high bridge or whatever. The chain bridge is a rotational yeah. for navigation? Yeah. Great. So they actually can do it electrically but also they can do it with a hand wheel? Yeah. So, um, putting a water line on it um, wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. I mean, sure, it would work, but you, you know, you could make it kind of sneak around, but get complicated. Um, no, I'm just saying, money wise, yeah. you're talking to about 15, 20 million. I mean, I'm sure that would be a lot less than an emergency situation. Plus, the grade is a lot flatter. Oh yeah. So uh, let me put a stop to the 15, 20. Uh, that's a very high number for the waterline connection to Amesbury. Uh, what Tom was talking about going under the river right. could be that much. Right. But, you know, there's a lot we're giving you. Um, we also have the ability to put it under the deck of the Whittier Bridge. I don't think it would be that much money under the deck of the Whittier Bridge. Um, underneath uh, directional drilling would be the best, but sure. that does come with a price tag. Sure. We have to evaluate that. So we're, we're going we're gonna, to. We're actually putting that out to bid for a feasibility study for an interconnect. Um, so that's one of the risks that we take is that we're giving you an update. Um, it's a moving target. If we wait until we had a game plan, we'll, the game plan is always moving. So we're doing the best we can to let, let you know what we're doing. We still have to put together a request for proposals for seeking an interconnect with another neighboring community, both for permanent and temporary. Um, so. That'll, that'll determine the price and which one's the best. Thank you. Is, that, is that right, Tom? I mean, is that summed up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think back in the 70s, they actually did that, Mike. You know, I think they, they, had a, they had a situation, they strung it out there, I think it was for a short period of time. I think actually Newburyport supplied um, Amesbury, from what I understand. But um, yeah, I think the fact that, it's, it, that that bridge operates, we kind of threw that out. I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, in fact, Amesbury made improvements on the other side to um, to their system where they've actually brought the, the 12 inch a little bit closer. So um, it, it's just uh, it's the commitment of the communities. And you know, we know we've talked about this when I was in Groveland and West Newbury, you know, and, and all of that. And, um, I wondered if that emergency, if you're really going to be moving a bridge. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. No, I know. I get you. No, I get you. You know, at, at yeah. that point, you, you're really going to look at it all. You know, even that short section, you just kind of couple it together and yeah. no traffic, you know. Yeah. There'd be a little problem if you brought there in the water then. Yeah. Yeah. Since West Newberry and Newberry Port share the same water sources, are they each allowed to extract only a certain amount of the water to keep it fair to both communities? Yeah, so it, it, can you repeat the 
you repeat your question? Can you repeat, you repeat the question? question? They didn't hear it. Yeah, so the, the question was, it, it, it was, if West Newbury and Newbury Board share the same water supply, right? Um, since they do. Since they do. Um, <laughs> yeah, are they allowed to pull the same amount of water? How, are they, how is that divvied up, basically, the amount of water? So the maximum? There, there is. So, and, you know, Mike can speak to West Newbury, but as far as Newbury Port, <clears throat> we're, we're governed by DEP. And the supply, essentially, that we're talking about, um, you know, that, that has registered volume, the city has registered volume and permanent volume. And, and Mike has the same. Um, we supply West Newbury with water through an interconnection. We don't, they don't actually pull the water from the reservoir. So we extract the water, we treat it, and then Mike needs it in West Newbury. Um, it's available for them. And that, that has a cap, you know, so there's, there's uh, only so much that we, that uh, two communities have decided quite some time ago um, that they'd be able to cap out at. Um, but as far as the permitting or the registration for West Newbury, that's a separate um, volume than Newbury Port itself. And proportionally, what is it for Newbury Port versus West Newbury? I don't know what Mike's permit is. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, well, our permit from our existing is around 58 uh, million gallons. Many years ago, and it's a very gray area with the city of Newbury Port, we had about 60 million gallons from their water supply to come to the report. We, right now, use about 20 million gallons on average a year, so we don't get anywhere near that number. Uh, I'm struck by your conversations of, uh, of the interconnection and cooperation of different municipalities because water sources are in other municipalities that we draw from, or the emergency plan that you're looking for with Amesbury. Has there ever been discussion about regional, regionalizing this and, and having a commission? Obviously, in other parts of the country, that's the way they handle um, these kind of more complex uh, issues. Second question, I was also struck by, and I think the mayor obviously touched on it, and I didn't hear what she said about where the resources were for financing all of this, or possibility. Uh, I was struck by that as well, in the sense of what percentage will be on Newberry Ports back in financing this versus looking, and, I, and I'm also asking that on a regional, wouldn't it be better to pull a lot of your resources of different uh, people that way to get funding for these rather than dealing it with just for new So since I've been helping helping with this project, um, since we brought in time bond, um, I've always had that question. Why are we fighting so hard? Yeah. I, I, I don't understand it. I'm getting so much stress fighting with our communities to get water. I, like, I don't get it. So, but I'm learning. Time Bond is teaching me a lot. Tom's been teaching me a lot. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them, but I don't understand why DP does not have a regional plan, because I'm a newbie to this. I don't get it. I think it's a great question. They recommend an interconnect, but from my standpoint, they could do more. That's my opinion. They recommend an interconnect. Do you have anything to add to that? Is there, no re is there any regionalization that you see that at their level? MWR, right? Yeah, there, there are some yeah. systems that have established a regional system. MWRA is one, Springfield Water and Sewer is another. Yeah. Um, DEP has not established regional water systems. You know, they've kind of left it up to the communities. And so the communities, you know, either choose to work together or, or not. Um, you know, the interconnections are important, and, and you know, Tom and, and John Eric have both stressed their importance because if something does happen within one system, then there is you know that opportunity to tie in, and, and like Tom said, it, it is your insurance policy. Um, that being said, I don't think DEP can come in and say you have to um, do the interconnect on you know long term basis. No, but they, they'll make suggestions. So if there's a, 
we do it, it's called a sanitary survey. They come in and they actually look at the whole system, they evaluate it, and they, they'll make recommendations uh, on after the evaluation. Um, if that finds its way into the sanitary survey, that just gives it talking points, right? It gives it a little bit more um, weight, if you will, that when you start talking about um, expansion or whatever that may be, whether it's an interconnect or a new supply or, 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 or you know, However, you may be addressing your, your shortfalls. Um, you know, DEP will, will address it in that, that manner. And as far as regional for uh, funding, um, again, uh, I've, I've been in the city government for 12, 13 years, and nothing is linear, and nothing is in a perfect uh, sequence. It's just the way it is. So our watershed management plan, it's going to be, we're going to try to keep it holistic as possible, but the funding and the projects will most definitely be uh, segmented. Because Tom's going to realize and, and work with the city council and say, hey, we really need this, so we do it. So as we piecemeal it, then we'll go after the grants. It, we don't have the ability of, of creating a perfect game plan of everything this week. Come up with a game plan this week. Completely understand everything that needs to be done because it's always changing. So um, we are aware that the infrastructure money is coming. And a lot of times that money will trigger projects uh, quicker. So we want to be shovel ready. Um, all I can say with that is we just we got a lot of work to do. It's all you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it definitely hasn't been all me. Um, I got here two years ago, and, we, and when I got here, um, I had discussions with, you know, the existing people. I knew folks that were already here. I've been in the business for over 30 years. Um, and, and I had conversations with John Eric, and I said, you know, here's some of the challenges that I see. And they were basically stuff that was already on, on record, right? Um, so it, it, it definitely is not just all me. Um, the engineering department's been a really big help and obviously having good consultants. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's some hard decisions to make. So ultimately what you want to do is just, you know, it starts here, right? It starts with this kind of discussion. Um, it builds from there. Um, but, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's all money. It, comes all, it all comes down to money. And um, if it's available, and you have that shovel-ready project, and you've got a good prioritization, I mean, that's, that's really the way to get it done. I, I want to give uh, climate change people kudos, because seriously, the reason why we're here, the reason why we accelerated all this work with Time Bond started with our resiliency plan, to really look at, you know, what do you guys know about the water supply? Oh, well, I found this, not me, we have, we have an existing report, it's clapped in dust. Take it out of the, out of the, off the shelf. They, can, they add a climate change to the water protection plan that we have, and now we're moving, and now we have to continue to move. And what I've learned with city government, you, you gotta keep that ball rolling. You have to keep the ball rolling. So when you guys ask to help, keep pushing the corner office, keep calling the mayor, keep calling this, your, your city council people, and just demand that we're getting it done. We'll do the best we can, but we're only staff employees. You gotta, you gotta keep pushing us. The squeaky wheel gets the projects. It's just the way it is. Uh, we have to wrap it up. Is there anyone that has one really important question? Well, it's not that part. Just a quick question for Ty Bond. Have you ever, or are you looking at any filtration systems for either wastewater, or we have a river, we have the ocean for desalinization? Have you looked at any of those options for water? So. Um, we haven't done a lot at, at the treatment plant. The report touches on the potential for desal, um, you know, as looking at, um, I'll say, big picture sources. And one of those big picture sources is a connection or uh, a withdrawal point from the Merrimack River, which would be desal. And, you know, just large ball picture, what might that look like? That's great. Uh, so, um, ARC is asking everyone to um, do the survey for the uh, Merrimack River User Survey. It's the Alliance of Climate and Environmental Stewards. Um, please do it. Grab this postcard on the way out 
and uh, jump online, and um, he would greatly appreciate if you do it. Uh, thank you all for, for attending. Great panel, what a great speaker. Thank you all for attending. Good night.